it's our pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Wonche Tazmini here uh, to speak uh, to us at the Elon Center. Um, Wonche, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with her, is a, is a prolific author and commentator on matters relating to Iran and to contemporary geopolitics. She's the author of Khakhani's Iran, the Islamic Republic and the Turbulent Path to Reform, which was published in the first edition in 2007 and again in 2009 on Ivy Taurus. She's also the author of Revolution and Reform in Russia and Iran Politics and Modernization in Revolutionary States. Uh, she's someone who's held a variety of academic appointments, ranging from a, a term at uh, the London School of Economics, where she was a fellow at the Middle East Center, uh, to uh, appointments at the School for Oriental and African Studies, as an Iran Heritage Foundation fellow, uh, and an awardee of grants from the British Academy. Um, uh, Dr. Tasmini's work uh, is situated at the nexus of modern Iranian history, comparative politics, uh, and global history. Uh, in her previous work, she's focused on processes of modernization and reform in Iran and the, uh, the relation between Iran's domestic politics uh, and state society relations. Uh, and um, uh, to these days, she is continuing work that she developed in her previous monograph on Russia and Iran, uh, working on a book uh, you know, very much uh, which will be of interest to anyone interested in contemporary events of work on, on Russian and Iranian bilateral relations. Uh, but today she's here to speak to us uh, about something that is, you know, uh, you know, very uh, contemporary um, uh, and you know, very much, I think, of, of uh, concern for any of us sports fans uh, you know, within the audience, uh, and that is the impact of the 2022 FIFA World Cup uh, on Iran, a clean sheet for scoring political points. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Is the volume okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, thank you so much, Behrouz, for inviting me. Um, thank you, um, Becky, for all the travel arrangements, and of course, to the center for having me. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit uh, about myself before I start my presentation. So I'm Gonja Tazmini, and as Dan explained, I have a, a background in international relations um, and comparative politics. And as you um, heard, sport and football don't necessarily feature prominently uh, in my biography. Um, I've mostly focused on geopolitics and uh, development and social movements in Russia and Iran. But today, I bring with me to this presentation some of the empirical knowledge that I have gathered in Portugal, where I'm visiting from. Um, it's also where I've been playing football myself for the past three or four years at an academy called Eshril Praia. Uh, this is a club with a long tradition of training women by former professional football players. So I was never a big football fan, but I became drawn to it because I have a 12-year-old nephew who lives in Canada, and every time he would visit Portugal, the realm of Cristiano Ronaldo, he would take me to endless numbers of matches, and he started to train at, at an academy, and then he convinced me to train at the academy, and so I've been training and I've been playing ever since. Uh, so I began to watch and to attend more matches, and um, I had the benefit of having some interesting conversations with uh, football agents, football players, managers, and coaches. And I began to understand some of the dynamics behind the scenes. And I started to learn more about the world of football, everything from player development to player transfers to team management. And of course, po in Portugal, football um, permeates social life. And you get a real sense of what it means to uh, live and breathe football. Uh, for example, at any one time after a, a derby or a high-profile match, every single news channel on prime time will be dissecting and analyzing every aspect of that match for a good hour or two. And, and this is, um, you know, when this is a match that hasn't been broadcast on, on normal TV. It's pay TV, and, and so not everybody gets to watch it. But they'll go on and on with pundits, and, and so um, it's, it's almost like a religion because of the impact it has um, on those that follow it with such passion. The stadium becomes this place of worship where the worshippers uh, the faithful go to see the prophets, the players they admire, and to, con to conduct their demonstrative sermons uh, from week to week. 
Um, so in Portugal, football culture is really part of national culture, and football players and head coaches are revered. They're society's role models and idols. So I'm going to draw on some of these observations um, on this field work, you could say, in my discussion today. I've presented some of this material at a conference in Qatar, uh, in Qatar University in September, um, that concentrated on Qatar's hosting of the World Cup and how regional countries are relating to this mega sporting event. Much of this content, of course, had to be adapted in the context of the protests in Iran. I've had to reflect on this material against the backdrop of the uh, uprising and amid calls for the Iranian national team to be banned from the World Cup as support for Team Meli is now divided in the charged and febrile atmosphere surrounding the tournament. Having said that, today's discussion is based on the premise that the status quo in Iran is as is. There hasn't been a major shift to any other form of government. Um, and I'm not here to endorse the regime's practices or to speak about the movement. I'm simply here to present an overview of the build-up to the World Cup and to explore Iranian football and its significance on broader levels uh, by offering snapshots or, or vignettes of political and social and athletic realities surrounding Iran's participation in football's global showcase. The 2022 World Cup in Qatar has been a catalyst for transformation, not only in the world of Iranian football, but also within Iranian society. In the lead up to the tournament, there have been several uh, noteworthy developments that I wanted to discuss today. And given the magnitude of the event, I've come across several vectors of analysis, from boosting regional cooperation to raising social and gender issues, to rekindling geopolitical rivalries, to raising, um, to, to becoming a site of a political contestation encompassing various dichotomies, the World Cup brings with it both challenges and opportunities that extend well beyond the event itself. So I'm going to draw on some of the observations and, and some of the field work, um, you could call it field work, in Portugal. I'm going to connect it to uh, the Iranian players and also their participation in the World Cup. So with this mega event being hosted in Qatar, a nation with which Iran has uh, favorable diplomatic relations, Iran and Qatar have engaged in a flurry of activities um, in the lead up to the World Cup. Um, notably, Doha hosted two talks, uh, two, two days of indirect talks between Iran and the US in late June, with the European U Union shuttling back and forth between the two contending parties. Um, while Qatar has been keen to mediate and to act as a broker in the nuclear impasse, the talks were inconclusive, um, as you know. There have also been several high-profile visits in May and June, where the two sides have discussed regional issues and nuclear talks, energy cooperation, private sector development, and collaboration in hosting the World Cup. With the World Cup being hosted in Doha, Tehran has added another dimension to bilateral ties by offering Qatar closer logistical cooperation between the two neighbors. Bilateral initiatives include uh, the facilitation of shipping and cargo transfers during the World Cup period, greater use of Qatari and Iranian airspace, that's increasing the number of flights between um, Doha and Tehran, and launching shuttle flights between Doha and Kish Island, and the establishment of a cruise line linking Iran's Boucher port with the Hamad International Port, which was slated to be inaugurated during the World Cup. A new Qatari tourist office has also been set up in Iran to facilitate travel for fans. While Kish is the main focus, the Iranian authorities uh, also hope to, be, to, to utilize other islands um, and cities around the South Hormuzagan province um, to welcome international fans, um, given the accommodation shortages in Doha. Earlier this year, the Iranian Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, announced that it would waive visa for travel from Qatar for two months during the World Cup. And um, so Iran is hoping that these measures will promote uh, the country as a, as a regional touristic hub well beyond the World Cup. It has long been established uh, that elite sports success in international sporting events generate feelings of joy and patriotism 
<clears throat> football achievements represent um, a mo moment of national pride and international recognition. Many observers of international football have examined the manifold relationships between the sport and various phenomena associated with ideas of nationhood, uh, nationalism and national identities. I'm not going to get into those themes today um, because the nexus between the so-called people's game and the idea of nationalism uh, has become somewhat blurred in the context of the current crisis and so as such it requires deeper reflection and analysis. But generally football is a conduit for the reflection and expression of, of national identity. It's also a terrain on which the politics and practices of, of nationalism uh, are played out and also uh, it's a, di a, a discourse bearer of the very idea of, of nation. However, when the Iranian national team did qualify, it was a moment of glory and uh, national pride with crowds celebrating jubilantly in the streets. I'm sure we all saw images of that. However, this unity has been somewhat eroded with many voices chanting, Team Meli is not my national team. Of course, nationalism is not a homogenous phenomenon, but rather arises in strikingly different manifestations with divergent manifestations. But generally speaking, international sporting success and recognition brings with it a particular manifestation of nationalism. It's a collective dream. Football in Iran will always be intimately intertwined with politics and with deep patriotic sentiments. And there are a plethora of an analogies and metaphors connecting the competitive sport to geopolitics. To begin with, there's a battlefield, there's strategic planning, there's um, tactical thinking. There are formations showing the arrangement of defenders, of midfielders, strikers. There's a clear gainful winner and a dispirited loser. There's a draw, a victory, a defeat. There are opponents who take positions, strikers who take a shot, and then there's a goalkeeper who's the last uh, line of defense. And then you have aerial and ground duels, you have counterattacks, and as in military combat, the ball like a bullet can ricochet, and inevitably there are injuries. There are team captains and coaches that act as commanders and generals, with each team trying to occupy as much of the territory of the other as it can leading to attempts to symbolically conquer the other side's stronghold by kicking the ball into the goal. From an Iranian angle, the World Cup is very much a political construct, with a football pitch serving as a site for the projection and perpetuation of political grievances and aspirations. In this year's draw, Team Meli, the Persian Leopards, as they are known, are grouped in Group B. Uh, with political content contenders England and uh, United States in two high-stakes fixtures along with Wales. At first, the chance draw created a flurry of reactions among Iranians, mostly this excitement over settling old, old scores through a political, through a potential win. And what fuels the passion for this so-called grudge match is the idea that somehow success on the pitch can translate into political success on the international stage. And one of the remarkable things about football is its unpredictability. You can score in the first second and you can concede in the last. And the beauty of the sport is that the underdog always has a chance. And to many Iranians, there's more at stake, there's much more at stake than just a football match. The matches present the country with an opportunity to defeat symbolically political and footballing contenders on the pitch and to score some much needed political points. At the same time, the world's biggest sporting event also presents opportunities to foster people-to-people -people relationships and networks, particularly at a time when tensions between Iran and the West are so high. The 1998 World Cup held in France reflects how one World Cup group game did more to assuage troubled relations between Iran and the US than decades of diplomacy or anti-diplomacy. In the match between Iran and the US in 1998, the two sides exchanged flowers and jerseys before kickoff. They posed for a pre-game portrait in a gesture of, of sportsmanship over politics or sportspersonship over politics. And Iran defeated the United States in a memorable 2-1 uh, victory. 
But despite this, the players recognized the, the important role that they had played in this historic match. At the time, US defender Jeff Agus famously claimed, we did more in 90 minutes than the politicians did in 20 years. 18 months later, both sides, both teams agreed to a friendly match in Pasadena in California. And in many respects, this, was, um, this match was far more significant because it was a friendly and it needed the cooperation of both sides. Football is unpredictable in so many ways, which is why there is always a glimmer of hope that these fixture, fixtures may turn out to be diplomatically fortuitous. Politics routinely invades the football pitch and vice versa. Football can invade for the football pitch can invade politics, the political realm. At the FIFA 20, 2022 World Cup, the intersection of politics and football become more visible and more tangible. Um, and so it remains to be seen whether the Iranian players can score some major political points when the final whistle blows. At the same time, football can be instrumentalized to further geopolitical antagonism. Political uh, actors have, have routinely capitalized on football for both social mobilization and for political propaganda, evidence of the web of linkages between football, politics, and society. Since its inception, football has been inscribed with tribalism, protest, military propaganda, and political symbols. Iran's victory over the US in over the US national team in, in 1998 is a case in point. So on in the slide you'll see to the top right we have Hamid Estili who um, scored um, the opening goal in the 2-1 win in 1998. And that is the I'll explain what that is in a second. So it's a case in point. Why? Because in November 2019, Iran unveiled new murals painted on the exterior wall of the former U.S. Embassy in Tehran, known as the Den of Spies, ahead of the 40th anniversary of the 1979 takeover of the compound. And one of the murals features uh, Hamid Estili scoring the opening goal in the 2-1 win. And tellingly, the mural portrays Estili's header as a, as a fist, as a punch in the direct direction of the Iranian, of the American players. And the American players look quite forlorn, especially the one on the, on the far left, <laughs> hands up. Um, so the state framed the match uh, as a struggle against oppression, imperialism, and global arrogance, linking success in the match to the triumph of revolutionary principles. And so through the use of historical and political references, the state and its media capitalize um, and use this opportunity, the opportunity, this World Cup fever, by reproducing and uh, reinscribing the post-revolutionary national narrative. Under the right conditions, professional football can pull off the ultimate hat trick. It can rebuild diplomatic bridges, it can reduce prejudice and enrich cross-cultural exchange. While the US-Iran diplomatic breakthrough is still far off the horizon, Iran's football talent in Iran has proven to be a game changer, a testament to the way in which football can bring communities together. That's the Jogo, uh, main Portuguese football newspaper, and that's Tarami and Beiran Land, and it says, agora em persa, now in Persian. Um, so Iran and Portugal's cross-cultural encounter has been a glorious one on the football pitch. And this is a terrain that is steadily expanding. And there's been a remarkable rise in the number of Iranian football players in Portugal. And each one of these athletes has adapted seamlessly into a, a very complex and demanding world of Portuguese football. We have players like Mehdi Taremi, Ali Alipur, Mohamed Mohebi, um, that have each followed the example of former Portuguese top league players, including Ali Reza Beiran Vand, Amir Albert Zadeh, Shahriar Moranlu, Jafar Salmoni, and Payam Niozman, all of them um, previously players in Portugal. The success of Iranian players in Portuguese Premier League teams has placed Portugal on the map by attracting Iranian football players trying to find a place 
in a Portuguese club. There's been an influx of athletes trying to find, follow the example of other, of other Iranian players. Equally, Portuguese talent is making its way to Iran um, in the form of professional coaches. And, and those are two Portuguese coaches um, on this side. Um, in 2022, two Portuguese trainers were signed. That's Ricardo Sapinto, uh, who was named head coach of uh, Esterlad, reigning champion in Tehran, while José Moraes took the helm at Sepahan FC in Esfahan. And now, of course, we have a Portuguese coach, Carlos Queiroz, managing Team Meli. At the same time, for a game so remarkably global as football, one of its problems continues to be deep-seated prejudice. As in the case of star striker Mehdi Taremi, who in one particular incident became the subject of Orientalist tropes and stereotypes in an online post from a rival club in Portugal. The Porto attacker Taremi, who is a native of Boucher, is Iran's highest priced international talent. And Porto's victory in the Portuguese league um, this May reinforced his status as a top player. Taremi's performances have prompted speculation that a move to an English premier club is imminent. And Arsenal and Chelsea have both expressed interest in him, although he is in his later years. <laughs> we still have hope. An Iranian who has now become immortalized in Portuguese football, Taremi's face graced Portuguese media channels incessantly in the days following Porto's epic victory. In June 2022, Ujogu featured Taremi on its cover and he's draped uh, with the Iranian flag. And the headline reads, Taremi Bandeira do Irão, Taremi the flag of Iran, while the caption read, the Iranian ambassador assesses the striker's impact even on bilateral relations. One cover line declared, Mehdi opens the doors to Portugal for Iranians, while another read, he was a subject of talks in the United Nations between the ministers of the two countries. The Iranian ambassador in Lisbon conveyed that Ptolemy's performance has opened the doors to Iranian athletes and that his popularity has even boosted Iranian tourism to Portugal. And he had explained in the interview that Ptolemy had become the subject of diplomatic pleasantries between the Iranian and the, and the Portuguese foreign ministers at the UN Assembly in New York last year. However, the so-called Prince of Persia has also generated hate from rival clubs. And in April, he became the subject of a racist rant on Sporting Clube de Portugal's official website. And the article is right there in Portuguese. Um, but it says, the article, which was written by a former sporting administrator, and not just a fan, referred to Ptolemy as a farsant, for, for which there's no easy translation, but the word farce is clearly um, embedded in that word. Discrediting Ptolemy as a fraud, the smear piece was replete with Orientalist uh, stereotypes, declaring that Porto had welcomed an authentic snake charmer, uh, Mare Afsungaro, uh, Encantador de Serpentes, a man from Persia who was ready to carry out his usual circus tricks. And so there was a lot of backlash um, uh, in the press because of this and it was widely debated and discussed and um, and so there was a lot of media coverage it wasn't accept it wasn't acceptable uh, and the August Jogu um, cover vindicated the racist episode by declaring a snake charmer well goals are his answer and this is with reference to Tademi's consistent performance scoring 62 goals in now 115 matches since he's been in Portugal. Off the pitch, the Iranian national team also faces its own internal challenges. Iran's World Cup hopes became shaky amid the sacking of the head coach, Dragan Skocic, with the team's star players at loggerheads over the decision. There was a side led by Sardar Azmoun, the Iranian Messi, uh, and the younger players who had been given time to play and they were not benched, so they were loyal to Scotchage. And then you had another group of more senior players, led by Taremi, 
who, and Jahan Bakhsh, for example, who uh, supported um, Kairoj's, uh, Kairoj as a, as a replacement. Now, um, Scottish had guided the national team since February 2020, and he was dismissed in July 2022, prompting widespread criticism from the public just months ahead of the World Cup finals. However, six days after he was dismissed, the Croatian coach was controversially reinstated on a technicality. The technical committee of the Iranian Football Federation had not realized that it did not have the authority to dismiss the head coach before it held elections for the new presidents, presidency in August, on August 30th. However, in September, Skocic resigned a day before Carlos Queiroz was announced head coach. And Carlos Queiroz was Iran's head coach um, between 2012 and 2019. All of this happening at a critical time, just two or three months before the World Cup kicks off. Incoming president of the federation, Mehdi Taj, who ran on a Queiroz-inspired ticket, brought back the Portuguese coach, who's feted as a hero after taking the Iranian national squad to two consecutive World Cups in 2014 and 2018. The uncertainty and the political maneuvering surrounding the fate of the head coach complicated Iran's World Cup preparations, with the Federation's limited financial resources and its difficulty in planning uh, warm-up friendlies. In the end, Iran managed to set up uh, several warm-friendly warm-ups against Algeria, Uruguay, Senegal, Nicaragua, and Tunisia. All of this sheds light on the Iranian Federation's organizational and managerial problems, and it raises other questions like club ownership, privatization, the need for foreign investment, the need to commercialize Iranian football, all of which are complicated by sanctions and the government's concern about political risks associated with privatization and private ownership. And stadia and football matches are, of course, a, a fertile, ripe arena for political contestation because of the large crowds that they attract and the potential for, for rioting. And as you know, most of the professional football clubs in Iran are affiliated with state-owned industry, or they are associated with the Ministry of Sports and Youth. Um, in one study on corruption and mismanagement, um, Hossein Mansouri and some other Iranian scholars uh, concluded that governmental appointments in the organizational hierarchy make it extremely difficult to demand transparency and accountability. And the problem is that these uh, government appointments are generally sp spared from public scrutiny. And so they suggest privatization as, 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 a, as a way of fostering public, public participation, of, of promoting good governance, uh, competition, and prosperity of the football industry as a whole. So while the World Cup is a formidable unifying factor, it can also provide the backdrop against which societal fissures can become apparent. I've mentioned that it is a site of political contestation and it's an arena in which tensions between civil and political society are played out. One of the issues that came to the fore was the question of Iranian female football spectatorship in Iran. In March 2020, during Iran's final World Cup qualifier match against Lebanon, hundreds of ticket-holding Iranian women were blocked from entering a stadium in Mashhad. The incident rekindled the debate on the right of Iranian women to attend male football matches. Although the law does not necessarily prohibit Iranian women from attending football matches, the extent to which injunctions are enforced is highly subjective. And in a dramatic turnaround on the 25th of August, female fans were granted access to Tehran's Azadi Stadium to watch a match between Esterlal FC and Sanat Emes Kelman FC in the country's Persian Gulf Pro League. Um, reportedly, there were 500 women in the segregated space, but this was all. Um, these are numbers that came from the Iranian media. There is speculation that this is a temporary measure, um, simply to alleviate pressure domestically and from international bodies like FIFA. And the reversal in policy raises several questions: Is this a temporary decision motivated by a threat from FIFA? Is it a question of Islamic norms? or traditional gender norms, or is it simply discrimination? In our ethnographic study of 30 Iranian male and female fans, 
Zahra Iskandari, Terme Iskandari, concluded that most of the research participants identified the state's unequal treatment of female and male fans as the crux of the issue. One participant said that there is no rule in Islam which says that women must not play or watch football. Another noted, even in Islamic countries, female fans are allowed to enter stadium. None of the participants were convinced that the stadium's environment was unsafe for women or that women's dignity would be damaged by hearing the verbal insults of male spectators. Another issue raised by the participants, actually women can become quite uh, rowdy as well, so <laughs> they might actually tone things down. Another issue raised by the participants was the fact that state media had not normalized female fandom by censoring the streaming of images of female fans, by excluding female fans in football TV shows, and by limiting feminine football news, the state adds yet another layer of obscurity to the female fan and the female athlete. This is Canal Ons. Um, it's a Portuguese football channel. And these are Portuguese uh, female uh, commentators and journalists and former players. So this question of normalizing images of women is a crucial factor which I've observed in Portugal, where football expertise is overwhelmingly considered to be the exclusive domain of men. Club managers, players, coaches, sports analysts and football agents. And to remedy these prejudices, the football channel Canal Ons, a subscription channel belonging to the Portugal to the Portuguese Football Federation, which broadcasts football, beach football, beach soccer, futsal, women's football, makes a point of featuring female commentators on its uh, in debates about players and in debates in match analysis. The channel also features female commentary and coverage of several league matches. While the channel is featuring more female hosts, studio hosts and reporters, the country is still very much behind. One coach told me that two years ago, you wouldn't see a football commentator on any of these um, football TV programs. In an article in the Portuguese daily, Diário de Notícias, one journalist observed last year, there is a long road ahead. Despite positive developments, there is still a pervasive lack of confidence in a woman's knowledge of football because there are those out there that think some questions are too good for a little girl to answer. As if innately the sport is male territory, women have been traditionally excluded from discourse on football, but they're slowly, slowly challenging these deeply uh, embedded stereotypes. And as Askandari's research participant noted, in Iran, in Iran, female fans are marginalized in, in the media. And it's a situation that Canal Ons, uh, as this anecdote illustrates, uh, can be slowly remedied. The onus, of course, is on the Iranian state to adapt to calls from female fans, and female athletes who are contesting oppressive gender relations. Iran is not immune to global influences, from global influences and sport. Uh, and the football in particular can kickstart a positive change in gender relations in Iran. Which brings me to the current situation and the image up there <laughs> um, of the player who's at a podium. The distinctive feature of this year's World Cup is a pressure on Iranian players to become the voices of dissent through expressions of solidarity with the Iranian protesters. At the same time, these players are facing enormous pressure, perhaps even threats, not to side publicly with the protesters as they seek to advance their own careers in a tournament held once every four years. FIFA's chiefs recently issued a stern warning to the 32 national teams, demanding that they focus on the football and not on ideological or political battles. And in a letter, FIFA underscored that the governing body was not a political organization and hence it was not in a position to moralize or to judge. And of course FIFA is not the bastion of virtue itself, but that was what they had declared. And during the past few weeks, Iranian activists and human rights organizations have been calling for FIFA to disqualify Iran from the World Cup.
not only Iran, but other footballing nations are also around the world are under on, on enormous pressure to use the tournament to highlight the issues that have shrouded the lead up to the World Cup. The host country itself faces widespread criticism for its human rights record, for migrant labor rights, the treatment of farm workers, our major infrastructure projects for the World Cup, women's rights, LGBT rights, as well as corruption allegations surrounding the bidding process. But then again, there's always the argument, there's one argument that James Dorsey explains, which is that perhaps Qatar was singled out, that there are double standards at stake. He says, Russia should have been co as controversial a host as Qatar when it won the bid for the World Cup over other bastions of football. In 2018, it had annexed Crimea. There were safety concerns over the rights of, of LGBT activists, it had labor issues, there was widespread criticism in football, there were allegations of doping, and all of this was addressed by the media, but then gradually swept under the carpet. In 2005, when London was awarded the Olympic Games, the UK was in the midst of an illegal war and occupation of Iraq. So if you're going to apply the standards and the indignation, where does it start and where does it begin? But members of Team Medi expressed solidarity with Iranian women on social media with statements on Instagram, on Twitter, with blacked out avatars and banners, or by wearing black armbands, or refraining from celebrating goals or victories to show their support for basic human rights. Esterlal refused to celebrate after winning the domestic Super Cup. That image on the bottom left. In the footage, the team captain, uh, Hossein Hosseini, can be seen lifting the cup in silence as many of the players keep their arms folded. In a friendly against Senegal, Iran's players caused a stir when Team Meli lined up for the national anthem wearing these black tracksuits or these hoodies on top of their jerseys hiding the crest in support of Iranian women. And prominent sports figures, I mean we've all read about Ali Doin, Ali Karimi, and the biggest names in Iranian football that have all vociferously supported the protests. It was against this backdrop that officials in Tehran insisted that the game between Iran and Uruguay be played behind closed doors. When protesting fans were inexplicably allowed into the game, two spectators were marched out of the ground by police midway through the first half. The warm-up against Senegal, also in a sleepy town in Austria, was also played behind closed doors. On the image on, on that side, on the right, in early October, uh, on match day three of the Champions League, FC Porto, where we have Mehdi Taremi, faced Bayer Leverkusen, where we have Sardar Azmoun, at home, where there were dozens of Iranian activists that had flown from all over Europe. Banners and flags were unfurled in the crowd with slogans in support of the protests. However, I know directly from fans that the mask-wearing activists accosted some of these Iranian supporters aggressively, hurling insults and abuse accusing them of being Islamic Republic complices and agents, which is unfortunately the ugly side of the protests. So I think this is a good, good bridge to my final point, and my final point is a dilemma, which I will throw out to the audience. Perhaps you can resolve it for me. As a football fan, how does one approach or process Iran's participation in the World Cup this year? Can you be a football fan and also support the protesters' grievances? Or is it just boycott and nothing else? We've established that Iranian football is deeply intertwined with politics, and the two cannot be disassociated from each other. However, football and the football industry is all driven by emotions. Being a football fan is a highly subjective experience, and that subjectivity sometimes overrides politics. So in a way, football can transcend politics. And it provokes such a strong sense of competition that's almost embedded in our DNA. It's like a fight or flight response, primordial, this, this intrinsic desire to, 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 to win. So we're almost biologically programmed to win. And during those 90 minutes, the emotions run so high and there's so much adrenaline and you are at the edge of your seat and you just want to see your football idol, Sardar Azmoun, place a winning header or a top bin 
autonomy, score, spectacular bicycle kick. At that moment, it will be a challenge to remember that the Iranian Football Federation is run by government appointees or that the Iranian clubs that some of the players have contracts with are owned by the regime or by government-affiliated industry. Because football is all about emotions. It's about generating passion, excitement, joy. It's magnetic and it has a unique ability to, to stir and generate emotions that sometimes supersede the weight of political principles or even political rationale. And if you're a diehard Estherlado sport or, or Perspolis fan and you're watching your favorite player score a winning goal in the 90th minute, are you going to be thinking about politics? So these questions reflect the power of emotions behind football, which are hard to define or to grasp. At that moment, we're witnessing athletic prowess, the feeling of a sense of pride of seeing a fellow Iranian score a goal on the world stage. Despite all the hardships that players have encountered, the prejudice, the linguistic barriers, the cultural barriers, the homesickness, the, the wheeling and dealing that it takes to get where they are. And then back home, all of the politics behind the World Cup, its impact on training, on preparation, the psychological pressure of having to take a stand uh, and to express heartfelt solidarity with the protesters, all the while not antagonizing a government that scrutinizes their every move. And then there's a the question of the player's future. For the Iranian players, the risks are both personal and professional. And the, because the World Cup is, is the pinnacle of global sport, it's a, it's a global showcase for talent, especially if Iranians hoping to move to Europe to play. And as I've conveyed by discussing Mehdi Tarimi, it's no simple task for an Iranian athlete to become successful. The odds of becoming a top class player are so low. The chances of receiving proper foundation courses, of being scouted, spotted, they're very low. And these players have become world-class performers in foreign countries. And they've come a long way, and that in itself perhaps is cause for celebration. And this, I had skipped this, but that's essentially a synopsis of what I just said. Finally, I will try to inspire some football passion here <laughs> with a World Cup success story and it is a Bain Advent. From a humble nomadic family in Loristan in southwestern Iran, Bain Advent had a boyhood dream and he had this incredible background. He apparently washed cars, he slept in the streets, he was homeless, he had run away from home as a teenager and eventually he made his way to Naft, to Paris Police and then in 2018 Russia, he was on the world stage. And he saved an incredible penalty kick, that is, I'm sure you'll appreciate that, um, by Cristiano Ronaldo, who was at the peak of his career. Overnight, he became a world star. And then he eventually made his way to Europe, and then to Bel went to Belgium, and then he went on loan to Portugal, and then back to Paris Police. But he became an inspiration for aspiring football players. And by his own account, in that picture at the top, he said he, when he held that ball, it was as if he was holding the world in his arms and that his teammate had to tap him on the shoulder, get up, it's, this has really happened, it's time to get up now. So it's not just a challenge of saving the penalty, but it's, it's conquering and achieving all of this despite all of the hardship and, and the struggles. So one asks, as a fan, how does one hold back the emotion, the joy, the moment he saves another penalty kick or a shot by, I don't know, Harry Kane or uh, I guess Gary, Gareth Bale from Wales. How does one support him, not turn your back on a fellow Iranian athlete, but at the same time, does supporting him signify a betrayal of the women in Iran? So I'll finish off by saying, how does one support the principles behind the movement in Iran? which by extension repudiates the state-affiliated team Melli on the one hand, and then appreciate the athleticism and the careers of fellow national players at the world's biggest mega sporting event on the other. How does one reconcile this dilemma? One consolation is, according to FIFA president uh, Gianni Infantino, um, the projected five billion viewers and 1.3 million visitors to Doha will bring attention to all sorts of social struggles. And the team Melli perhaps can put the spotlight on calls for basic human rights. So I will finish here 
And um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, but on a lighter note, I will quickly just show a picture of myself and in the spirit of the beautiful game. I'll show, my, show a photo of myself and Cristiano Ronaldo and my nephew. <laughs> yeah. So he's our goat, our greatest of all time. But I've heard that um, Messi's quite popular in North America. So um, <laughs> I'll leave that uh, for you to decide. But thank you so much for listening. And if there are any comments or any feedback, I'd love to hear it. Thank you.